I want to begin this first service of the new year by just asking you, if you would, grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. That's where we're going to be at today. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. You can also get out your study guide and take notes if you so desire. So, um, I stated this last week, but I wasn't here. But I, I, I find this type, this type of this time of year to be just kind of a strange time. The end of 2018, going into 2019, it's a time where we, in general, as people, what we do is we kind of reflect upon the last year and we start thinking about the new year. Maybe set some goals, maybe some things that we would like to obtain. Um, several weeks ago, one of my friends on social media posted something that I thought was kind of interesting. They said that they were going to spend the last two weeks of 2018 trying to complete all the things that they stated that they wanted to do at the beginning of 2018, right? And so what happened was this. They got to the end of the year, and they realized they hadn't done everything they had set to do, so they were going to cram it all into the last few weeks of 2018 so that when 2019 rolled around, you know, it would be... Um, Everything would be complete. They'd say, I got my list done, whatever. I don't know how they did. I don't know if they completed that task. But the truth is, and I think we would all here today admit it, that um, drifting from the goals you set, drifting from the mission that you may have had for a certain year or a certain time, it's easy to do. It's easy to do. Really, if you want to drift from a goal or a, 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 a something you've set, Really, you need not do anything, right? That's how easy it is. It's so easy that you need not do anything. So if you're aiming to do something and you want to do something and you do nothing towards obtaining that or whatever, you're going to eventually drift away from it. Now the deal is, is this. Here's the deal. It's not necessarily a big deal if you don't hit the marks that you set for a certain year, your personal goals. Maybe it's a little disappointing, but it's not a, a big deal. But here's what I want to talk about today. There is a certain type of drift that is of great importance, and there is a danger if you drift from it. I call it, or it's called spiritual drift. Spiritual drift. And, and, and it, too, is easy to do. It is, right? You, you need not do anything spiritually to drift. You don't. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been there. I don't know. Um, maybe you've, this scenario, maybe this scenario's happened in your life. Maybe you wake up one morning and you look around and you think, um, how did I get here spiritually? Right? Like, like I hadn't counted on it. I hadn't planned on it. I did not aim for this, but nonetheless, I'm here because you know what? I remember a time when I would read my Bible. And I remember a time when I would pray. And I remember a time that I would attend church regularly. In fact, some of you might even say this. I remember a time, not only did I attend church, I even volunteered at church, right? But time has passed and somehow I'm in a situation where I'm not attending church. I'm not reading my Bible. I'm not doing any of these things. So you sit there and you say, how did I get here? Spiritual drift, spiritual drift. So here's what I want to do. The very first Sunday of 2019, I want us as a people to address spiritual drift, and spiritual drift is addressed or talked about in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to read the text, and then we as a people are going to walk through it, and we're going to let the weight of the Word of God sit on us, and I believe it will encourage us, and I think it will be helpful to fight this spiritual drift that I am quite certain we are all familiar with on some level. So let me read the text. I'm just going to read the text. Four verses. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what the Word of God says. Therefore, we, and that's us, believers, must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. All right, it's a tremendous text, a lot's going on. Just real quick, let me kind of 
set up what's going on here. We do not know who wrote the book of Hebrews. We don't know. But we do know it was written to some Hebrews, some Jews, whom had not seen Jesus, but God had saved them. They start this church. Now, once they start this church, they start following Jesus, something happens to them that they had not anticipated. They start experiencing difficulties, persecution. People are coming against them. And because of this, some of them start pulling away from the church. Some of them start to not be involved with the church. Some of them start to drift from the church. So the writer of Hebrews writes this text to that church 2,000 years ago about drifting. And I would say, and I know that this would also, and this does also apply to you and I 2,000 years later because we find ourselves in a very similar situation from time to time. So the writer of Hebrews, he writes this letter. He begins by giving them some advice. So let me just address that first. We're going to see the advice given. The advice given. This is verse 1. I'm just going to read it one more time. Here's what he says. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift from it. All right? Let's look at it. Let's walk through it. Let's pay attention to the words. The words matter. Every word in that verse is put there because God wants us to know something about him. Very first word, therefore. Pretty simple word. I would, I would say this, I would argue this. Anytime you're reading scripture, you see the word, therefore, circle it, underline it. It is telling us there's a transition taking place. What it means is that everything said after the word, therefore, is based upon something the writer has just previously said. Now, since we jumped into chapter 2, verse 1, we don't know what the writer of Hebrew just said, so I'm just going to let you know. The writer of Hebrew has just said that Jesus has the highest honor He is eternal. He is unchanging. He has the greatest occupation. He is all satisfying. That's Jesus. Therefore, because of who Jesus is and what we know about him, based on what we know about him, Christians, that's us, we need to pay very close attention to what we know about Jesus. Why? Because if we do not, we might drift away from it. And that's what he's saying. Hey, the question is this, why? This is my question, why? Why, why, why is it that if I know who Jesus is, and I know he's good, I know he's all satisfying, why is it that I would drift away from it? My question is this, what brings about unholy drift? And that's the question I ask myself. What brings about unholy drift in my life and in our life? I came to the conclusion there's several things, there's three predominant things, and that's what I want to begin by talking about. This is helpful to me, but I believe there are three primary things in the New Urban South, which we live, that cause spiritual drift, so I'm just going to talk about them. There's some others, but these are the ones I think can really eat our sack lunch. Um, First, I would say there's the pool of morally neutral things. And you know what? I just remembered something. I think I skipped, in in your outline, I think I skipped the very first base thing. And uh, did they put that up here? Oh, man, I'm going to throw these guys a loop. Here's the foundational thing, and I'm building all of this up too, okay? None of us drift towards holiness, all right? That's That's my underlying foundation, but none of us drift towards holiness. So let's get back into this. First thing that causes drift is the pull of morally neutral things. All right, back on track. Um, The question, what is a morally neutral thing? A morally neutral thing is something that is not necessarily bad or evil, but can be used in a way that is bad, right? You see, there's this thought, I think, among many Christians is this. Here's the thought. Here's the thought. The thought is this. If I can protect myself from messing up on that one big sin, then I'm not going to drift. Whatever the big sin is in your life, whatever that sin is that so easily entangles you, so you sit there and you think, if I can guard against that. But meanwhile, while we're doing that, we're allowing morally neutral things, really small things, to kind of stack up on one another, and they're pulling us, and we're unaware of it. Most drift comes from morally neutral things. So you may say this, what exactly, um, Travis, what is a morally neutral thing? I made a list. I will share a few of them with you. I would ask that no one here throw anything at me. I'm just delivering to you what I've seen. (laughs) One, 
television. Television is morally neutral. I want to say this real quickly. There are some things on television that are not morally neutral, and no born-again man or woman's got any business watching it, all right? But there is some that is morally neutral. And here's what I would argue. If you find yourself sitting there, I've seen this. I've had people talk to me. So you get, you get, you get this, um, you're sitting there, you're binge-watching a, a, a TV show, and you know the name of everybody in that TV show, and you're sitting there, And you think, you know what? I know every name of everybody in this TV show, but I don't know my neighbor's name. Church, come on, you got a thing. What's that about? Have I drifted in some area that I ought not be? Um, There was a guy, he came up to me, he told me this story. I know it's a true, it's so funny. He was sitting there, he said this, he was sitting there, he was watching the, the, the show Friends. He was watching an episode that he had already seen three times. He's sitting there on his couch, you know, got, got his Cheetos, got, got the drool coming out of his mouth. And I'm telling you, he said this, he goes, while I was watching an episode that I didn't like the first time, I'm watching it the third time, it occurred to me that I had not even read my Bible that day. It's, hey, it's easy to happen. It's easy to happen. I would say um, sports can be a morally neutral thing. They're not bad. But I tell you what, we can get into such a degree of following them, exalting them, that they become a bad thing. Social media. Here's the way I would say it. When you take a good thing and you elevate it to a God thing, it then becomes a very bad thing. Right? we we got to fight this morally. we got to fight these morally neutral things. They'll come in and they will get you off course. Second thing that I think causes a lot of drift among us is the pull of familiarity. The pull of familiarity. Um, once again, the New Urban South, South, I see this occurring a lot. You see, it is natural for people to come to regard as commonplace the things that they're around a lot. So, in other words, you can see something that is beautiful, But then you spend time around that beautiful thing for an extended period of time, and all of a sudden the beauty seems less beautiful. And I've seen that. I've seen that with the Word of God. But that not only happens in the spiritual world, it can happen in the physical world. And I've thought on this, and I want to share something with you. I have an example in my life from the physical world, and I want to apply it to the spiritual world. This is... um, such a true story, man. When I, was, when I was in seminary, I'm in seminary, and I had the opportunity to go over to the Middle East, my wife and I, do a few things, but one of the things that we were going to get to do, this is my first time to the Middle East, but uh, we were going to get to dig on an archaeological dig for one day, all right? And I'm like, that's cool, man, right? I'm like, Indiana Jones, right? You, you know my last name is Jones, right? And I'm like, hey, guys, when we're there, Call me Dr. Jones. You know, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, but I thought it'd be cool. Okay, here. Spoiler alert. It's not as cool as you think, all right? We get over there. We do all the stuff, right? We get the one day. We're going to dig on this archaeological dig. And here's my job assignment. My job assignment is this. They got this little sifter, right? And people, they're going to be bringing buckets of dirt, putting it in there. And this, this is my job. That's it. All... All day long, that's it. It's hot. I figured that out. It's the first time I was in the Middle East. That's hot. So I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there, you know, just doing my job. And, and maybe after the hundredth bucket, I find this little shard. All right, I find this shard. Oh, that's cool, man. That's cool. So I call the director of antiquities over to where I was at and show it to him. He looks at it, and he's like, he, he goes, that's awesome. That's great. And he looks at me. He goes, hey. What bucket did it come from? I'm like, bro, there's a hundred buckets here, man. Take your pick. And, <laughs> woo, woo, woo. He did not like that, man. He was, you know, he was, he was upset. He was upset. He's like, what seminary did you come from? And I lie. I say, I come from some other seminary. I don't want to embarrass my people. <laughs> so he tells me, listen, listen, listen. You're going to keep doing that. You're going to have to take notes and all that. I'm like, fine, fine, fine. Okay. A little bit later, my wife, she is, she, she got a better job than me, man. She got a better job. She's actually getting to dig in a little square. That's her job. And so she's digging in a little square. 
And it just so happens that while she's digging in the little square, she comes across an artifact, all right? She actually, she calls over the director, the director of antiquities over there to see the artifact. She shows him the artifact. He says, this is an Iron Age one grinding stone. She found, as far as I'm concerned, it's the Holy Grail, right? I mean, that's amazing. It's amazing. He loves it. She loves it. And then my wife, my wife does this. Well, she, she shows me. She looks at him. She goes, can I have it? <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, man. It's about to go down. That guy looked at her, and he said, yes, you can take it home. And I'm like, what? 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 And God in his gracious laid on my heart this. It just pushed into me. I just think this is what I, I'm going to build on this. But he made me aware of the fact that the director of antiquities was not immune to my wife's beauty. He didn't have a chance. <laughs> and then as the Lord works, it comes back to me. I felt the Lord press in on me, man. Travis, have you become immune to your wife's beauty? Because I remember a time when I first met her, she would take my breath away. Now we're married, and perhaps I had become immune to her beauty. I repented, and I said, God, I never want to be immune to my wife's beauty, right? I don't. But now let's roll that over. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember when God saved you? And do you remember the day after or maybe the very moment after he saved you, you go open the word of God and it just jumps out at you. Every single word is beautiful. And you're circling it and you're underlining it. And I remember you go out, go out to Walmart and you buy the, the Sharpies that have every color and you're loving it. But what happens? Time familiar that thing that once looked beautiful to you no longer is as beautiful and I'm telling you I've seen it in this very room the, the danger is real it's real it's real so I can, I've seen this church real quick I'm going to pay attention I want you to pay attention this is so important I'm sitting there and I'm maybe preaching on Jesus walking on water All right. and I can see some people there's a glaze in their eye as though they're thinking you know I've heard this before and I get it and I want to stop, and I want to yell. Do you get it? Church, do you understand a man in the flesh walked on water like it was dry land? We should be forever and perpetually amazed at that. And so I would say this, if you find yourself in that condition where you are no longer amazed at the atonement, no longer in awe of what God has done, and it's easy to get to because it comes so familiar where we're, we're at, I'd say do the same thing I did when I realized maybe I had become immune to some of my wife's beauty. Fall on your face. Fall on your face and say, Be God, I beg you, I beg you, I beg you. Stir that. Let me see. I want to see the beauty in the text as I once did. I want my affections to Jesus to be stirred in such a way that I'm perpetually living in light of it. And I tell you what, don't get your face off that ground to your great God stirs in you. And he will. I've seen it. I've seen it in tribes in Africa. I've seen it in the Middle East. I've seen it in Europe. I've seen it all over the place. Our God moves. He saves. He's real. And his word needs... It's awesome. Hey, we still got... Hey, but... Hey, by the way, there is a direct proportion between the amount of times you say amen and how long you're going to be sitting here. I'm just telling you. So, <laughs> Happy New Year. Let's keep going. Three, real quick. Oh, we're still on point number one. Don't worry. <laughs> Pull a busyness. I'll do this fast. Pull a busyness. Hey, listen, guys, we're busy people. We are busy people. And that can cause drift. It can cause drift. And there is this deception going around in our culture that's trying to convince you that you can find joy outside of Jesus, and you can't. You can't. Here's what I would say real quickly. There will be a time for everyone in the sanctuary here where you're going to get hit. You're going to get knocked down. Everyone here will at some time take a punch to the soul. And if you were hoping in... Anything other than Jesus, on that day, you will be devastated. Your trinkets will not comfort you. They won't. Only Jesus. Okay. So how am I to, fight? How am I to 
battle against this, right? If I'm not drifting towards holiness, right? We don't naturally drift towards holiness. And I got morally neutral things pulling me. I've got familiarity with the truth pulling me. I got busyness pulling me. What can I do? What is the antidote? What should I do? Well, the Word of God tells us, pay much closer attention to what you have heard. Cool. Great. Right? That's great. Okay, well, here's the question. What have I heard? Right? What have I heard? Let me tell you in a nutshell what we've heard. The gospel. The gospel. That Jesus Christ died on the cross in your place for your sin. If you're a Christian, you have been saved. If you're a Christian, God the Spirit indwells you. You have been adopted. You have been called. You have been empowered. You have been sent. You are an ambassador for the living God. God making his appeal to a dead and dying world through you. So as Paul has said, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Guys, we got, we got to pay much closer attention to what we have heard, and that will fight the drift. All right. So the author of Hebrews makes his argument. That's his argument. I mean, he makes, he, not his argument, he makes his he, advice. That's his advice. That's his advice. Now he's going to make an argument to support it. All right, this is number, verses 2 and 3. Here's his argument. We're going to see the argument made. All right. Let me briefly tell you what the argument is going to be, and then we're going to jump into it, okay? Here's basically what he's going to say. He's going to say this. The more you know the more you will be accountable for, and the greater the danger is if you drift away from it. And that's the argument, but let's read what he says. Here's the argument. For since the message declared by angels, real quick, that's talking about the Old Testament law. I don't have time to get into it, but that they would have got, that's an allusion to the Old Testament law, proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, all right, let's, let's pause here. I want to talk about this, okay? He's saying this about the Old Testament law, two things. Now, remember, he's building this argument to support the advice he's already given us, okay? First, he says, the Old Testament law was reliable. And it was. And then he says, if you drifted from it, if you transgressed against it, you received retribution, punishment. And he says it was just. All right. Let me see if I can work this out. Um, one example, all right? You get this guy in Numbers chapter 15, verse 32. All right? There's this guy who deliberately drifts from and breaks the fourth commandment. All right? The fourth commandment is that you're supposed to keep the Sabbath holy, okay? So you get this guy, you get this guy, he knows the command. It's not like he's ignorant of the command. But he drifts from it, he disobeys it, and he willfully breaks it. And here's what the guy does. Seems like a small thing. Here's what the guy does. The guy picks up some sticks. That's what he does. Now, I don't know what he was thinking. I'm imagining he's thinking, hey, listen, listen. I know the law. I know what God has said. But I'm just picking up sticks, right? I'm just, how big of a deal can it be? I am just going to pick up sticks, all right? The people find him, they put him kind of in custody, and the people go up to God. They, they pray to God. They say, hey, God, listen, God, how big of a deal is it to you when someone willfully and knowingly drifts from what he knows to be true of you? God replies, and God says, take the man outside the city, stone him. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, I've done far less than that. I'm like, whoa, whoa. That seems kind of extreme. But the author of Hebrews just said, no, it's not extreme. The author of Hebrews says that that was a just punishment for a person who has willfully known and ignored what God has said. It's a just punishment. All right, that, that's... He's building this argument. Now he's going to take this Old Testament argument, and now he's going to compare it to the New Testament. He's going to compare it to what we are under, the covenant of grace, this great salvation, this salvation that you and I know, what you and I have heard, what we know. He's, now he's going to compare it. Get to verse 3. Here's how he starts this contrast, this comparison. He says, how shall we, now he's addressing you and I, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? In other words, how are we, who have known something even greater, escape 
calamity escape this, this danger when we willfully drift from what we know to be true. Now, here's the question I got. Here's my question. Right? Here's my question. Why is this salvation so great? In, in other words, why is what you and I know greater than what he knew? Well, the, he answers. He tells us. He's going to tell us why what you know is greater than what that man know is. Look what he says. Verse 3, continuing, it, talking about the it, is what you know, what you've received, was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. All right? So why is it that what you know greater than, of more value than, what the Old Testament guy knew? Two reasons. First, he says what you know was announced by the Lord. Like what we've heard, this gospel I know, this gospel you've been told, it was first declared by Jesus, God in the flesh. So it makes no sense that we would willfully drift from these things. Like this guy in the Old Testament, he's like, hey, hey, I'm just picking up sticks, man. Take him outside, stone him. The argument is how in the world would we get off from drifting? We've been told stuff by Jesus. I can give you example after example after example. One of the, I, I, I meet with men I love dearly. And they'll tell me something like, they're involved in an unpure relationship with their girlfriend. And then they will talk to me as though it's not that big of a deal. They'll say something like this. They'll say, they'll say, well, Jesus is full of grace and he will forgive me. And I'm like, yeah, brother, you got that right. He is full of grace. And you're right. He will forgive you if you repent and stop doing it. But you do not walk around as though it is a small thing. To offend the living God? Is that a small thing? Church, is that a small thing? To willfully offend the living God. We can take it to something else because I've thought about this one too. In Hebrews, the author goes on to say that we are not to forsake the assembly. It means that it's not a small thing to forsake the assembly. But sometimes we act as though it does. Like, like, like you know, I'm going to sleep in this weekend, whatever. Once again, I compare it to the other guy. It's just a few sticks. It's just one weekend of forsaking the assembly. But you, hey, everyone here today, you know this, you know this, you know this, you know this. It's easy to forsake the assembly one week and for that to bleed into a second week, that bleeding bleed into a month and a year and so on and so on and so on. We cannot go around acting as though it's not a small thing. Let's continue. Second thing he says, what we know has also been confirmed by those who have heard. In other words... In other words, that refers to the apostles and the first generation Christians, right? So you got, that's the argument, right? If the guy in the Old Testament was put to death for willingly ignoring the fourth commandment, how do we think we can willfully ignore and drift from the gospel that was declared to us by Jesus and affirmed by the apostles? Real quick, we're going to kind of go through this rapidly because... Um, he hammers this home because he's going to continue by giving us what I call the accuracy confirmed. Now he's going to pull out, pull out God the Father. He's going to say, hey, listen to this. Not only did Jesus say it, not only did the apostles confirm it, God the Father has affirmed it. Verse 4, while God also bore witness, he tells us how God bore witness, by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So he's like, hey, if that is not enough evidence, right? If you're sitting there and you're thinking, I don't know if that is sufficient, compelling evidence, he says, man, you need to know this. God the Father's also bore witness to this really three ways. One, he says, signs and wonders. I'll do this rapidly. Signs, you read the New Testament. Signs point to the mighty hand of God. Wonders, they brought amazement and awe of the living God. Various miracles. You cannot read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can't, you can't turn a page without seeing a miracle. 
And they show the power of God beyond human ability. And finally, he says, gifts of the Holy Spirit. That is, the gifts of God the Spirit indwelling those whom have been saved, empowering them, gifting them, sending them, using them for his glory. So, so here's the grand argument. Here's the grand argument. If the Old Testament was so binding that every infraction was justly punished, then how much more accountable are us, we, we in this room right now, who have the word of salvation that came from the, Christ, the lips of Jesus, affirmed by the apostles, and God himself bore witness by signs, miracles, wonders, and gifts. Verse 3 question, here it is. How shall we escape? If we drift from this, how, that's the question. How shall we escape if we ignore our drift from such a great salvation? Now, this isn't talking about the loss of salvation, but this is talking about the dangers of drifting from what we know to be true. Why would we drift from that? So, fight the drift, church. Fight the drift. How, you say? How? What's the antidote? He's told us. I'll say it again. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. 2019, my desire for myself, my desire for our church is that we would be a people who pay close attention to what we have heard. I don't know what 2019 is going to bring. I'll share this with you briefly. Um, yesterday, um, Facebook, it pops up memories, whatever. Ten years ago this weekend, my family and I were in a minivan driving to a church by the name of Silverdale. I had no clue what the Lord was going to do. But he's been good. Oh, he's been so good. And I'm telling you right now, I don't know what's going to happen in 2019. Real quick. Hey, I don't know what's going to happen in 2019. I'm going to tell you this. I know this. Some people are going to get saved. Some relationships are going to get restored. Some people are going to get baptized. Jesus is going to be exalted. Don't drift. Don't drift.